Hey, it's a new world, gotta adapt to it. Innovation, information, more than the average. Russian, please ignore the interruptions. Cause this is digital discussions. All right, guys, on today's episode of Digital Discussions, I'm super excited to catch up with an old friend who was the director of real estate at Chipotle back in 2004 when I ended up landing them as a client. And I get to chop it up with him and talk about how to land larger national credit tenants as a tenant rep broker in the industry. I know you're going to get a lot out of it, and I hope you enjoy Welcome to Digital Discussions. I have an amazing friend and somebody I've uh, really had a, a pleasure to work with for basically two decades now, man. Time flies. Mr. Mark Frankel. Mark uh, played a major role in my development as a commercial real estate professional, uh, as an in house real estate person for Chipotle uh, when we first met. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, you know, I'm telling the story quite a bit nowadays about how I got started in brokerage back in 2001 ish, uh, and, uh, you know, had the opportunity to work on the Starbucks account and then ultimately, uh, played a role in bringing Chipotle to Long Island, New York, um, which is the market I focused on at the time. And now Mark today has transitioned to the dark side of the business, the brokerage (laughs) side of the business. Uh, and and is at Newmark. So, Mark, welcome to Digital Discussions, man. Thank you for coming on. Great to be here, Jay. It's uh, you're right. It's 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 been a long time, and uh, it's been been fun getting there with you. Thank you, man. It's been uh, it's funny. So, I, I as I say everything I just said, it takes me back to uh, you know pitching pitching a national account very early in my career again i had the opportunity to to work on the starbucks account uh and and that opportunity came from working along with a senior uh person at the company i was working with at the time and i you know i kind of ended up getting that account uh again through somebody more senior than me but kind of rising to the occasion and uh and spearheading that account and then as the story goes when i tell it you know i was in la visiting friends and uh, I was working out of a FedEx office or FedEx Kinko's at the time, whatever the hell it was. Mm-hmm. And I'm staring at this like interesting facade that I'd never seen before. Left all my shit on the desk, literally walked across La Cienega into the first Chipotle I'd ever seen. And from that moment, I was like, this thing is interesting and I need to get involved. So I kept calling corporate and eventually I got to you. Yeah. And again, I, uh, you know, we were talking about this before. I'm not sure uh, about the first contact. What, what I really the first time there was an impact. You know, that, that Jay Siano sticks in my mind was at, at our first face to face, which which was in Vegas, and and I think we were trying to figure this out. Maybe what 2003 or so. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah, because I remember um, when I when I yeah. met with you, I was talking about mm-hmm. you know the the future plans, and we'll get into exactly how I prepared for that meeting because. I think that's extremely important for people with less experience to understand because, you know, I always pull the like, who am I? Like, why would one of the most sought after mm-hmm. tenants on the planet choose to work with me, especially when I'd only been in the business, you know, a handful of years at that point? Well, again, it, it's interesting you bring it up because uh, that that's probably why you came across the way you did because of, of that, you know. And, and, you know, being in the same position you're in now, I, I, I feel the same way. You know, it's uh, we're both up at night, not sleeping, thinking about that meeting the next day. Uh, we're insecure as hell. I mean, everybody thinks that what we do, you know, re- requires confidence. But I really think to be successful, it, it requires insecurity. You know, you, you've got to like, what can I do to be better? What can I do to show this guy I'm good enough? And and um, I think it was that plus whomever you were working with, well, you were with Gaiman or Shallot or whoever you were aligned with in-house at Starbucks, yes. did a pretty damn good job of, of, of showing you what it took. And, and a lot of those guys, again, I was at McDonald's before Chipotle, and, and you know, a lot of the Starbucks guys and McDonald's guys all went to the same sort of, you know, McDonald's University, learned the, you know, the, the brick and mortar real estate business there. And um, look, our jobs are tough. Um, we, we had to perform, we had to produce, uh, but, but understanding what it was that we needed to do and, and preparing for that 
I think to me is what always struck me as, as something unique that you did at that meeting. I um, appreciate it. You showed up, I, I mean, to this day, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've trained new people in my business. It's something I think about. Um, you know, Vegas is crazy. You've got 15, 20 meetings a day, and, you know, and everybody's coming in asking the most, you know, particularly brokers, you know, how much do you want to spend? And, you know, and they tell you about how many big deals they did and how much money they make. You showed up with, uh, it was a binder, maybe about that thick. Um, you had mapped out every limited service restaurant in Long Island. You had every potential trade area I might think about. You had demographics. Whatever was state of the art at the time, you had already done. And you had done it. If you didn't do it specifically for me, you certainly make it look like you did it specifically for me. I mean, I had to be 50, 60, 70 hours worth of work in that book. Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, I did it all for you. So I think that, you know, I think, <laughs> okay. I think that's like, a, you know, people are, are they, they're confused about, you know, well, you know, maybe it was luck that you got that account. <laughs> no, I spent the 50 hours that you right, recognized right. preparing that information specifically for the, the tenant, right? Like I, I, I completely custom tailored exactly the strategy that if I was hired by you, I would have suggested we use. I did it up front, knowing there was a good chance that's I would never get the account. Well, that, that's what, and again, A, the fact that you, well, a couple of things. Before we even got there, um, having gone to the Chipotle across the street from where you were in California and, and obviously doing your homework afterwards and understanding the culture and how the company worked, you know, that, that was apparent you had done that. I, I'm, I'm blown away by how many people come and sit and talk to me whether they want to come work with me at Newmark or whether it was at Chipotle and they want to come work with me there. And they don't know anything about the company. Um, yeah. they, they don't understand what they do, how they work. And, and to me, that's like, okay, we're done. Uh, so obviously you've done that. Um, and, and more important than, than making the investment, which I certainly appreciated, it, it showed me that you knew what I needed to get done and that you were going to make my life easy. Um, because I look, these guys are busy. Um, I, I had, you know, five states, probably 30, 40 markets to deal with. I think when we were working, we maybe spend um, maybe two days a month together. And, and in that two days, I had to know that the 20, 25 stores that were going to be in that pipeline were being covered. And, sure. and I didn't have time to go do the maps and do the, do the you know, do the site. You were doing it for me. And, yeah. and the fact that, you know, you knew how to do my, what I needed you to do and that you were going to make my life easy, you know, made it an easy call. Um, no, I appreciate and, uh, that. I, the, I, uh, so did I. <laughs> I. No, of course. And I think, again, like that's so, there, there are so many young people today that reach out to me and, you know, for guidance, tips, advice, you know, just how do I, I want to work with a national company, you know, I'm, I'm doing the local mom and pop thing and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at it for a year now and I want to, you know, I'd love sure. to be working with a, a well-known national concept with uh, with credit etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know the short story for me is always well listen you got to do the hard work right like and and if you don't do your homework and you're not the reality is if you're not really uh, if if you don't deserve to be working on that account right like why would somebody who's pitching up against me get the job over me if I'm now in the business 20 years and I was working like that 17, 16 years ago. It's, it's, it'd be tough to pitch against me, but the reality is it's possible. You have to put in the work though. There's no, I always look at it as there's no elevator to success in our industry. You got to take the stairs and you get out of it what you put in. Let's go back to like early McDonald's sure. because you're right. All of the Starbucks, that, that entire original team of folks that I was working with in 2002, three, and, and still to this day, Dan Shalit's still Starbucks to this day. Right. Um, you know, they, they, a lot of those people came out of McDonald's, uh, the Gaimans of the world, the, right. yeah. you know, um, and, uh, and McDonald's, you know, with Gr Ray Kroc grinding it out. I mean, mm -hmm. McDonald's is a real estate company. Everybody yeah, knows sure. that now because of the movie, The Founder. If, even if you're not in our industry, you know McDonald's is a real estate company. But early Chipotle, McDonald's was involved, and that's how you ended up at Chipotle? Uh, I never heard yeah, that story yeah. from you. Yeah, I, again, uh, 
Steve started the company. I think he got maybe seven or eight stores open um, and he went to raise money. I think his first round was friends and family. Uh, and, and then eventually he hooked up with a group at McDonald's at the time was, was looking for new brands. Uh, they thought it would be a way to, to sort of give their franchisees new avenues for growth. They had bought Donato's Pizza. They had bought uh, Boston Chicken, which became Boston Market. Um, they even bought a piece of pret manger And Chipotle was one of those acquisitions. And, and um, so, so I remember even the count with this cute name, they called it like Leverage, like L-E Verage, but it was leverage. Um, you know, <laughs> let's not hire, let's not hire all these new real estate people because Chipotle had like three guys hanging out in Denver. Um, let's use McDonald's guys. And they, and they hooked up with McDonald's people in, in most of them are in Columbus, Ohio, in Chicago, in New York. And it was eventually, initially going to be McDonald's people finding the stores, building the stores, and maybe even operating Chipotle's almost like a franchised version. Um, it didn't, you know, as, as we both know, culture is a really important thing. And the culture, you Food know, with clashes. integrity. <laughs> yeah, everything was, I mean, <laughs> all, all along, you know, uh, up and down the line, the culture didn't mesh. Um, and uh, thankfully it didn't, because what ended up happening is, is uh, they started moving Chipotle away from McDonald's. I actually wasn't allowed to quit McDonald's and go work for Chipotle because McDonald's owned me, so to speak, and they had a contract with Chipotle saying couldn't take people. I actually had a I had to resign from McDonald's and take another position. Um, and I didn't think I'd get hired by Chipotle. I was just so mad McDonald's wouldn't let me go. I took a position with a bank. Um, and like two, three days later, I got a call literally from Steve Ells saying, Mark, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to people, you know, at McDonald's. Now that you've quit, they'll let us hire you. Would, would, would you come on board with us? Um, so, so yeah, then, then I jumped ship. And I think yeah. when we started working, I was officially a Chipotle employee. I um, think but, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah you first couple of years ago. Enough burrito bucks, so I, you must, that must have come from <laughs> yeah, Chipotle, yeah, yeah. not McDonald's. Yeah, the uh, yeah. so it, it's super interesting because I, I I never I'll never forget you know uh, sitting around a table with Steve Ells, you like Monty Moran, a bunch of the right. uh, what what was the construction uh, Carl Baylor. Call oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of folks, right? And, and we're yeah. so we're, we're at the first deal that you and I did was in Hicksville on 106, 107. It was a 3,500 yeah. square yeah. foot, former Krispy Kreme owned by Sears with a mm -hmm. drive through And I yes, remember sir. sitting inside the building with Steve Ells and the team talking about closing the drive through which is obviously like a cardinal sin on Long Island, <laughs> closing a drive through right. Now they're uh, gonna go crazy trying to put one on it. <laughs> that's my point. It's like, you know, it's so funny. It's like, yeah. full circle um, with any, you know, never say never, right? Like the type, right, right, right. the conversations early days, Chipotle were, you know, we will never go into a mall. We will never, you know, have a drive through so on and so no forth. No rest areas on the highway, no rights. <laughs> no, nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, but listen, the Chipotle is obviously a completely right. different piece today. Uh, but any other, just before we transition and get into more of a general discussion, any other, uh, just kind of tips for young people. I mean, you you hire and train young people at Newmark. I do the same at Saber. Um, anything out there that you would tell the audience who's watching? That's you know, I, in this strange time with with COVID and uh, obviously the downturn. You know, it's it's the biggest. What upsets me the most is that a lot of young people in the industry are you know going to have a tougher time now making a living and kind of you know, getting out of this period of time. Is there any pointers or tips you would give anybody? Well, look, first thing, you're right, but as, as we've both lived through a couple of cycles already, there's also a lot of opportunity with stuff like, there's gonna be a lot of transactions, there's gonna be a lot of boxes that get empty and need to be refilled. So if you could figure out how to make it through this time, I, I think coming out of it on the other side should, should have a lot of opportunity. But I think one thing really specific uh, to, to, to what's going on, and we'll talk more about, you know, what got you this job and how I think other people can get the job. But especially now, um, you mentioned the McDonald's people, the Starbucks game, um, very few companies are, I mean, when I was working for McDonald's, we probably had several thousand people in the development department. Chipotle at the time when we met, maybe we had two or 300 stores. We probably had, you know, people that were just involved with opening new stores, working, getting in a, ch a check that said Chipotle on the bottom. Um, probably almost a hundred people between, you know, real estate, design, construction. 
look at some companies now, even companies with 70, 80, 100 units, there might be one or two people that are involved yeah. with development now. Right. Um, so I think it, it pushes so much more of, of, of what's needed onto the, the you and me's of the world. Um, and, such a great and I think it's also unique. Um, what, one of the things I always do, and I think it's go to LinkedIn, figure out where the guy you're sitting in front of tomorrow to pitch doing real estate for them may have come out of operations. He may, he may have come out of accounting. He may have come out of finance. Um, you know, he may have you know, come out of back of the house if it's a food company. And depending on where they came out of, um, you know, they're going to have opportunities that, that, that you have to fill. And I think it's a different pitch if it's, if it's a, you know, if it's a chef and, and he's, uh, or a food guy, he's not going to know a lot about the nuts and bolts about real estate. If it's a finance guy, you know, so they, they're going to need a different set of, of um, skills from their partner. And, and I think you have to be able, you know, you have to be a chameleon and you got to be able to provide them. I think that's also, that's a great point about, uh, you know, especially younger people and how to win business and why are you right for the job versus somebody else who's in the industry longer, so on and so forth. If, if you do your homework, like you just suggested, uh, and also join, you know, some, a, a team that, you know, people are willing to uh, help educate you and, and teach you the ropes. There's so much opportunity because I think the, I think the middle of the road broker is going to be the most impacted. I think, you know, somebody like yourself or myself who's been in the industry a long time and understands real estate operations, construction, uh, you know, technology, which is a, a whole different ball game today than when you and I first started working together in 2004 with Chipotle. I mean, right. the world has changed so much. There's so much access at your fingertips, mobile GPS data, you know, back then it was all right. like, I think Buxton was like the newest, hottest yeah. thing, which right. a lot of companies still work with, but you know, there's so many other tools today that can do sales projections and things of that nature, which are eliminating a lot of those hundred jobs that you were just referring to. Right. Right. And we don't cost the company anything. We don't that's, get paid, that's, that's correct. Yeah. you know, unless we're actually making, uh, doing a transaction, which I think is also such a strange concept and, and probably in this environment will change in some way. Right. No, you're right. I, I think, look, it, it's basically right now about the, the, the way the, the system is working and, and it's not bad if it continues this way, but you're right. It is kind of awkward. I mean, the landlord is financing the, their research and their market entry strategy because that's who's eventually paying us and we're doing all this work up front. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's a different world and I think we, we've got to be able to fill those gaps in. For I mean, I, you know, you've, you do a lot of work with fitness folks and, and, you know, sometimes the principals of these companies are, you know, they're, they're, they're into fitness. They're, they, don't, they don't know real estate. You're, te you're teaching them. Yeah. Um, and, and, and my job has expanded so much as a result of, you know, working with founders since working with you with Steve Ells, right? He was one right. of the first founders that I was able to like sit down with and hear, you know, the exactly what the vision is and, and, you know, lunch, dinner, parking. I remember back, you know, being pounded <laughs> into our heads, um, you know, so w to your point, and by the way, Steve was a, you know, a trained mm -hmm chef right that exactly. went to high right. yeah, exactly. yeah. Institute. like he he learned the real estate thing on the fly thanks to people right. like you and you know the other people on the right. team right. around him and in fitness same thing you know by the way i come in and actually fix problems uh early on that's kind of what my job is it's trying to right. you know fix the things that were done wrong leading up to me joining you know the team and then ultimately once we you know, figure out the things that aren't working, we can, you know, go from there and focus on the strategy moving forward. But, you know, I, I, at this point, I don't even necessarily consider myself solely in the real estate business. I'm in the, you know, business optimization business. How can I help you? No, you have to be. Business. No, it's, 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 you're right. I mean, it, it's really, you've got to be there. I had a boss years ago at McDonald's. You said, look, I, I, I'm an executive working for McDonald's who's current position happens to involve, you know, doing real estate for them. And he was right, you know, because you, you might be working on, you know, there might be a throughput problem, there might be a visibility problem, parking. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into whether that, that new store is successful. And, and if it's not, then, then we were not successful. Yeah. Um, we tell people that all the time. It, it, if, if this store does really well for you, 
I'm going to get to open another one for you. If it doesn't, I'm not. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, um, we kind of have to know their business. Yeah. So let, let's transition a little bit and mm -hmm. just talk about New York city. Let's talk about, you know, sure. obviously where, uh, where the city is today. Um, and, and, you know, how it's faring since everything, you know, shut down in March. Um, you know, I personally was spending three, four days a week, uh, in the city, you know, up until obviously March. And now I'm in once a week, you know, taking my meetings back to back and getting back out into the suburbs. And, you know, obviously when I'm in the city, it's a lot slower than, than we're used to for obvious reasons. But, you know, what are you, what are you seeing since you're, you're, you're in the city a lot more than I am over the last six months? Uh, yeah, not, not enough. I, mean, I live in Brooklyn, so I guess that's the city, but as far as going into Manhattan, it's, it's been, I'd say the past month or two, there's been, a, let's say, uh, I think what happened, we went into the summer and in general, the summer was a time when even people, when things are normal, people would yeah. sort of go to the Hamptons to go away. Uh, and I think people try to use sort of Labor Day as, as a, you know, a, a demarcation. Let's, let's get back in and try. Uh, and I've been doing that. I've been trying to go in two or three days, actually go into the office versus working from home. Um, it, it's tough. Um, I think there are some markets um, where, where you walk around and but for a lot of people wearing masks and a lot of people eating outdoors, it, it's almost normal. Union Square looks great. Uh, down, you know, the, the uh, Nomad is, it, there's still people out and about. Um, they're, they're still doing their thing. Uh, it, areas where, you know, local New Yorkers tend to go and and uh and consume and, and be shoppers they're, they're not clearly the way they used to be but they're not as bad um markets that were a lot more focused on um office workers and tourists are, are both getting hit really hard i think um times square oh, is, is, Times square oh it's scary it, it, it's, it's scary. horrible i feel bad uh you know all of the entertainment's closed the yeah. theaters um because of that a lot of the shops that deal with the entertainment are closed um midtown east midtown west the office driven retail is is trying but they're struggling we've got a lot of clients and they're and they're they're doing what they can they're doing a lot of takeout if it's food um that they're they're trying to work with 25 percent occupancy inside but you know it's got to be killing them um and, yeah. and restaurants even in the best of times you know we're, we're operating at such thin margins so uh look i i, I think everybody's hoping that just around the corner, there's going to be some relief. But I, I think the further we go, the more challenging I think that gets. I, um, I agree. It's actually, it's, it's, it's very sad because we've already seen so many businesses that we know and love go out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's also more challenging, I think, in areas that have such high rent, like New York City. I mean, right. you know, the rents are... are uh, some of the obviously the highest rents in the world, so it's it's not easy to you have to be doing a lot of business to pay your rent, and it comes back to you know the whole issue of the tenants not being able to to you know do enough business to pay their rent, uh, and then the landlords you know obviously also kind of being sandwiched in the middle because they they need the rent in order to make their mortgage payments. Uh, you know, for the most part, everybody's different, but. Uh, it's yeah, it's just sad, man. The longer that time goes on, it's just so discouraging. Yeah, look, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I I, I think uh, look, and this sounds almost a little insensitive. I think current tenants are going to have a tough time. Um, yeah. if, if you're a national and you could weather the storm and you just figure out how to make it through the next three, five, six months, whatever it is, um, I think you'll come out of this. And and you know, you may, you know, particularly the, the guys who are aggressive now are, are able to get some pretty interesting opportunities with new locations. Um, Jeffrey and I just uh, signed a restaurant lease and, and a good example, these, the, the landlords that can uh, are, are being fairly flexible with, you know, if you go in and you take a few months to build and if you open up before the, the pandemic is over and you get a percentage only deal for another several months, um, I think there's a lot of that stuff going on now. So, you know, People who are signing leases now uh, are getting the benefit of, of basically, you know, free construction uh, plus limited risk ramp up time because, you know, the, the, they're usually able to negotiate some sort of, you know, percent only deal in, in, until things get better. Um, and, and, you know, even, even using a conservative estimate, uh, 
if you're starting now, by the time you're open and, and, and things start to kick in a little bit, we should be past this. I think most people agree with that. I, I love that. I, I like the, uh, you know, I, I, I think you're right. I think there are, you know, a lot of opportunities as a result of this. And if you, you know, a lot of companies could not afford to go into New York City. And now right, they right. probably can if they have a good yeah, business, yeah. you know, and they, they structure the lease accordingly. And they have a, a landlord that's willing to, you know, partner with them and understand that they have a little bit of a you know, they need some assistance and a little relief kind of getting their business off the ground. I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah. And that's what we're, I think that's, look, that's what's going to happen. I think if you're asking, if you're an existing tenant and, and you're trying to figure out how to make it, I, 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 I do feel badly. I think you're going to need a lot of help. I think you're going to, you hopefully have a, a good partner as a landlord. And, and as you pointed out, it might not even be that they're a bad partner. They might not be able to help you because they may have a mortgage and a bank and people that don't allow them the flexibility that they'd want to give. But if, if you step back from a macro perspective, uh, we'll get through this and, and, and there will be opportunity. It just, there may be some, you know, some damage. There'll, there'll, there'll be some people who don't make it. Um, yeah. Listen, I'll, I'll be honest also, you know, to your point earlier, like there are some tired ass retailers out there yeah, that yeah. have gone long past their expiration date and we should just let them go. Like, they, you right, know what right. I mean? Like, I think that uh, what's interesting and, and I think you'd agree is, you know, in the retail real estate space, you and I have seen a crazy evolution over the last 20, 30 sure, years. Sure. So, you know, people who are not in our business, when I go out to dinner and I speak to people that are not in our business, they're, oh my God, retail's dead and da 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 How do you get up and, you know, how do you sleep? And I'm like, well, actually, retail's far from dead. It's been evolving for a long time since this thing called the internet came around, actually. And guess what? COVID accelerated the inevitable by like five to seven years. But right. at the same time, you know, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I feel bad for the office brokers, the office right. world, because you know everybody was plugging away as if like you know life was great and normal and so on and so forth. And boom, COVID hit, and every single person—I don't care who you are—is now rethinking your office situation and whether or not you're going to spend time in an office moving forward. If you are, how many days a week? And I'm telling you personally, I'm downsizing our offices and uh, going as virtual as possible because I don't like being stuck in an office all day. I don't want my team to be stuck in an office all day. Granted, the marketing folks, accounting, you know, those, right. those folks are behind a desk. But, you know, real estate professionals don't need to be behind a desk all day. You and I could operate just mm -hmm. fine from wherever we are with all the tools and technology that we have at our fingertips today. We can, but, but, and, and that's where, look, the, the jury's out on this and, and I'm on a you know conference call with, you know, the Newmark kind of the, the big company every, every, yeah. uh, actually one, one this morning. Uh, and, and I think what we're hearing, and it's probably, especially the younger guys, whether it's law firms, whether it's uh, new associates in a, you know, uh, working for a real estate company or working at a PR agency, the new folks need to, they need to have people see who they are and what they're doing and to learn. Um, that's sure. hard to do remotely and on a Zoom call. So I, I think, you know, there will be a swing one way, but I, I do think that when there's nothing, you know, keeping us from wanting to commute into the city, people are going to still want that experience. Um, would you prefer to be working, you know, all things being equal, would you be prefer to be in the city in your office five days a week? Or will this change, you know, make you like, oh, maybe I'm not, I'm going to go in you know, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, work from home Monday and Friday, like that type of hybrid thing, or are you like chomping at the bit to get back to the office every uh, I, I think this has shown me that, that there's a way to be effective without, you know, you know, being like, you know, Fred Flintstone and sliding down the dinosaur at six yeah. o'clock when the whistle blows. And I, I think we could be more flexible and, and, and be more efficient with our time. Um, you're also I think, not a newbie to your point, right? right. Not, I think, I think not, the younger people though need to be in an office. I think though they also need us to be there with them and, and right. we don't have to be there seven days a week. Right. I, I think if it's two or three days that, that you, you know, we're there, uh, yeah. they may want to be there more often so they can work with each other and, and, and kind of cross pollinate, um, particularly with what we do, you know, not everybody is always, you know, a new, new listing comes in. I, I need someone to help that's 
kind of good at working with this specific type of retailer. And, and I look out in the office and, oh yeah, what about him? It, 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 it's, that doesn't happen as easily when, when you have to, you know, find the guy on a Zoom call. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's, whether, you know, whether it's a, a new associate at a law firm or, or someone in an ad agency, I think there is something to be said for, um, you know, these guys collaborating live. Yeah, no, I think for us, I mean, we're, we're you know, a small boutique firm where right, everybody right, right. knows each other regardless of how long they're in the business. So it's not right. as challenging as it might be for a large organization, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but no, it, it, th things will change and things things will well, adjust. But look, I, I, when was the last time you were in JC Penney? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I always use that as an example. But listen, right. for other reasons that you and I both know really well, some folks cannot let JC Penney disappear. Right, they have a very yeah. big interest in keeping J.C. Penney, keeping the lights on at J.C. Penney, right? Because if J.C. Penney goes away, it triggers a lot of other things that they don't want to happen. Yeah, but is that life support? You know, is is that you know? It's, it's they, they had a, deck furniture on the Titanic. Right. So I mean, they'll slowly transition it. If, if nobody's coming in there, if if it's not generating, you know, the same sales per square foot as all the people around it they'll eventually find something else to do with that space. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, it, it costs them a lot of money to put that wall up. So they, they've got to do something with it. What McDonald's is that behind you in the picture behind you? Oh, that's the, that's the first one. That's, um, that's the one in Chicago with, uh, you know, the, the first, I shouldn't say the first one. The first one was in California. That's the one uh, that, you know, where, where the museum is now in, in uh, so that, that's what most people at McDonald's in 1955 think of as the first McDonald's. Right. It's the, uh, the Pike's place of the McDonald's world or the. Uh, correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. 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 I don't know that one as well. Des Plaines, Des Plaines, Illinois. Got it. I did read uh, grinding it out. Yeah. Was you right? Yeah, that was a the first one. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. early on, mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously every Starbucks book. No Chipotle books out there, huh? Not that I know of. Uh, you know something? I just saw something a couple of days ago. Uh, Monty Moran, I think, just released a book. Oh, really? I think it said something, something, but but guac is extra. I forgot the, but I literally uh -huh. saw I saw it on LinkedIn. Uh, so um, that's probably the first one that'll come out and. Uh, while Monty wasn't running the ship, but uh, you know, initially he was always Steve's uh, attorney, so he was kind of involved from the beginning. So it should be some interesting stories. You know what? Well, it's interesting because to your point, you know, again, I think I did a good job pitching to you why I should be your broker in my market for Chipotle at the time, because I truly wanted to be and believed that I had what it took to do it and put in the work before I even showed up to the meeting. And I think that's something everybody needs to truly understand. And I still do that today. I mean, you know, goes without saying, I think a lot of people are just gen generally lazy uh, and just kind of want the, you know, the upside without actually doing, doing the work. But, you know, for me, the culture of a company that I get to work with, especially today is so important, you know, and I, I've always held the fact that I've, played a role in Chipotle's expansion strategy pretty early on in, in, you know, in the company's existence as near and dear to me where like, I, you know, when I see a Chipotle that we did together, you know, I, yeah, I see yeah. it, it has that like nostalgic, you just go back to that place in time. And then, you know, fortunately as a broker, you work with so many different companies. So you get to really learn the ins and outs of so many different businesses. You meet the people that are, you know, uh, that are, uh, came up with the idea and then the folks that are executing the idea. I think it's one of my favorite parts about what we do for sure. It is. Look, and it's not that often that, that uh, we were both fortunate. We came across a company that, that was truly a pioneer. They, they, they sort of did that kind of, they did that segment of the, of, of the business differently than anybody else. And, and obviously a lot of people after them try to jump on that bandwagon, but really there was no, they created the segment, right? Yeah, it's fast like, casual didn't really exist. It, you know, they, 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 they did it, the whole food with integrity, farm to table, everything. It was all, you know, they were the first. Um, and, and yeah, it was just the right combination of things at the right time. Um, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, and then it's funny, like the, you live in Brooklyn, right? So it's the, yeah. I love when you're traveling and you hear, oh, you know, Fishtown is the Brooklyn of Philadelphia. You know, there's always the, 
for the brotherhood. <laughs> and then right. same thing with fast casual. It's like, oh, yes, it's the Chipotle of Italian food. Right. It's the right. Chipotle of, right? I, I, sure, it's, sure. it's become like uh, everybody's tried to figure out the same magic mm -hmm. with, uh, with every type of cuisine, including Chipotle, by the way. Not every yeah. uh, shop house uh, did not uh did not no it, 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 it was and and i don't steve didn't wake up with this great idea and execute it perfectly right away i mean it evolved and he had a lot of you know input from other people but it, it just was circumstances timing and and uh obviously you know, he had something special to start with but it, it didn't get there all at once um but one thing you know you you did work real hard i just wanted to go back to one thing you said you know i, I you know you put the work in up front uh and you certainly did but, but I think just as important is, is um, you did your homework and you knew what work to do. Um, I, I think um, putting together, I've seen a lot of people put together presentations and, and they're just, I don't know, you're, they're, they're talking about how good they are or what they can do. And as opposed to saying, okay, let me sit in that guy's chair. What does he need? Um, and, and understanding what, you know, what they want and what they need and then doing that work. Because just just going out there and working hard is 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 it's certainly good, but but really understanding and, and I think you did that. You understood the brand, um, you understood the process, and again, I think your your friends at Starbucks did a did a great job in showing you what was needed to break into the Long Island market. So you obviously recreated it, but you recreated for Chipotle. Um, Completely. I mean, I, I really truly believe that without the opportunity to work on the Starbucks account mm -hmm. and learn from Starbucks how to you know, design and execute a strategy, I never would have been able to prepare that information, you know, truly, again, thinking like the tenant, you know, thinking like I was in your position and, you know, uh, putting together the information that you actually saw as valuable. And then what you said earlier was huge, that I was able to help you do your job well. You're super busy. You're all over the place, right? Anybody that's, that's uh, working in-house at a company is very busy. They typically have a lot of geography and they need people that are going to help them do their job better, make their life easier. And I think that's ultimately what I, what I did, what I set out to do. Um, and by the way, again, that's, you know, what I do to this day. I mean, but I've evolved so much and now I cover the entire country. You know, it was back then it was, man, I, Long Island seemed like a pretty big area back in 2003 and four and yeah, five yeah. and you know and all of a sudden you start to you know just understand um you know i focus my time primarily obviously on the tenant side and have since those days and you you start to your brain just you know starts to get hardwired to think in a certain way where you can apply it to any type of business any market any you know so um so it's, 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 it's really exciting. I think I agree with you though. You know, we've been through downturns, right? We've been through, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the list goes on. I've been through a lot of them. You've been through a lot of them. And I think that there will be a lot of opportunity, more opportunity. Like the, the deck is being completely reshuffled right now. Right. Right. You know, the, the, the playing field has been leveled. And I think for people who are willing to work hard and, uh, and, and, you know, add value that sky's the limit. No, that, that look, it, it's, it, it's, it, there's a lot of assets out there that, that need to be repurposed. Uh, you know, you brought up, uh, you know, a, a particular retailer that, that people are trying to sort of fake it with, but that, that's not going to work long-term. I mean, yeah. even if you look at what uh, a thousand give or take malls that, you know, the, even the most, uh, optimistic people think, you know, coming out of this, we'll have 400, maybe, maybe 300. Um, what are we going to do with the rest of them? Now, they'll be there, but they're, they're not going to be functioning as they are right now. No, they'll be Amazon distribution centers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Look, that, that's one use for them, and hopefully yeah. it'll be something. But you're right. It, it, it's, look, people are, uh, consumption is changing. People are, I don't know about, you know, you know, I'm sure your wife has a lot of boxes coming to, to the house. To, oh. <laughs> my wife. I mean, it's, it's, it's every day, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's more things that, that say Amazon than uh, and that's got to be made up somewhere else. So. Yeah. Well, I think, look, I, you know, again, it, it's, I always say like, we don't need a, a whole bunch of retailers selling the same purple sweater. Right. Like, or, you know, so it's, 
I think that ultimately, you know, you're right. Consumer behavior has continued to evolve. I think people that were hesitant to use technology for a lot of things were forced to in March overnight. And the new habits that they have, they're, they're not going back. If, if the, the COVID thing was like a three month thing and it was like, oh, well, you know, I figured out how to order on Amazon and, you know, now I'm just gonna go back to the store. You know, now that we're approaching, I don't even know what it is, is it month eight, whatever it is, it's like the new habits have been formed and uh, I think also for, you know, different generations, I think the older generations, you know, the ones who like refused to go to an ATM initially, right? Like <laughs> I'm not going to go get cash or put it mm-hmm. into a machine. Like I can't do that. It's the same thing. So, you know, this has accelerated everything technology in our industry, which is basically, you know, lagging big time from a technology standpoint. Uh, so I think in some ways, if there is a silver lining, you know, some positive things will come out of this. Um, but, you know, you have to kind of figure out where you, what, what your position is and how much you're willing to accept this change. Yeah, but, but, but again, I think it, you know, where, where one door closes, another door, we've, we've seen this before. And, and you yeah. know, people have also been spending, you know, 10 months staring at their kitchen and they want to redo their kitchen now. And, 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 you know, they, their home decor places are crushing it now because people you know, are, are in their home more. Um, yeah. uh, people are cooking more, they're buying more knives. They're, you know, so, so there's, there are entertainment. I think people are going to be so starved for some sort of um, entertainment outside of the home. Um, so, so yeah, whether it's, exp- it's a great point. You have a lot of experience in the, in the movie theater space. Right, right, right. And I think that's a good example, right? Because, you know, and, and in my world, it's, I've been super busy because every project wants a lot of fitness and wellness, right? right, and, right. and by the way, a lot of fitness and wellness is going to be necessary on the other side of this as things start to stabilize. But what happens to the folks that have been operating at 25% capacity? You know, do they make it through this funky right. kind of COVID cloud? Uh, or do the folks who are not as established at this point benefit because they don't have to restructure, you know, 150 leases uh, right, and right. You know, all of that stuff. So I think, but the movie theater segment, which is entertainment, probably one of the biggest categories of entertainment is majorly disrupted. And now obviously sure. a lot of people are just consuming, you know, Netflix and, Amazon and whatever Hulu. I don't even know. I'm 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 not great. <laughs> no, you're. But you're right. And and that's an industry we we don't know where that's going. But there'll there'll be something that people are going to want. Some kind of maybe it's live music. I, I've got a friend who's who's out looking for outdoor live music venues. Um, you know, and 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 because the same thing. He said, you know, it'll be safer. People will be more comfortable. But you know, every everything's going to be outdoors in the winter <laughs> in New York and Detroit and Chicago. Uh, outdoors. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I lost it. You there? Um, you know, listen. I, I I like the I like the positive outlook. I agree with you know entertainment, obviously, because it can't be replaced uh, by you know the internet, essentially, right? I mean, some mm-hmm. things can, but you know, let's let's stick with the you know the physical brick and mortar entertainment. I think it's huge, but there's going to be a lot of space that becomes available and not a lot of new tenants to ultimately take that space that are in the retail sector. I think medical is going to backfill a lot of space, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, schools, churches, a lot of uses that wouldn't necessarily have been considered retail uses uh, in our past life. Yeah, no, I I think that's it. And and then, like I said, we we, we just uh, opened a few, I think there's one opening uh, we're we're building in Levittown now, this UK kitchen retailer, as an example, Ren Kitchens, where Adam and I are, uh, Adam Weinblatt and I are bringing them over. We're opening, our first one opened in Milford, Connecticut, uh, Mm -hmm. soft opening, the hard openings next week. Um, People like that, yes, people sold kitchens before, but there wasn't a chain of a hundred of them. Right. Um, so I, I think there'll be, uh, you know, with what's going on with floor and decor and, and uh, the TJX, uh, you know, home goods companies. Yeah. And uh, th- there will be, you know, morphing into areas that, you know, whether it's furniture, uh, there's still things that people like to see and touch that aren't very practical to, to buy online. 
For sure. Um, Are you doing again, ghost kitchen space, the virtual kitchens? I mean, that's another very popular. Not category. yet. Not yet. Uh, one thing we, we are doing, we're working with, we have an outlet center that, that uh, we're releasing in Staten Island that, that actually is, is uh, look, we, we went through a, a hiccup, you know, because of what's going on now, but our sales for the, for the guys that have opened up here, yeah, look, we had a few people, True Religion was in there, Brooks was in there, um, Jockey, th those companies all went south, the companies did. Yeah. Uh, so we've got empty stores because of that, but the stores who stayed through like Nike's doing, you know, 900 bucks a foot, you know, with, with 80% of the tourists not there. Yeah. Um, so I think outlet business is, is going to probably be, uh, if nothing else, all of these, these, these hard, you know, these brick and mortar stores with, with merchandise that they, they missed a couple of seasons on want to move it through outlets. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, it's very fluid. I think they're, you know, we, we've all seen entrepreneurs that, you know, the, the good ones identify something before everybody else does and, and jump on it. Um, yeah. And I think we're starting to see that now. So um, it, it's, look, we've got some work to do. <laughs> uh, you've got a lot of work to do, um, for sure. But I, I don't want to take up too much time. No. We're at the 45 minute mark here. And uh, I just want to, you know, before we close up, uh, anything else, any, any thoughts, any, uh, Anything about you know the future of of the biz? Any words of wisdom from the great Mark Frankel before we jump? I don't know about that, but but um, look, I think our business itself has to be cautious. I, I think people that are doing what you're doing, what I'm trying to do. Uh, you mentioned you're not a real estate guy as much as you are. I wouldn't call it a problem fixer. You, you're sort of looking at the whole business and and, and streamlining it. I think that's the approach we have to take because if our sole function is to connect um, a buyer and a seller or a leaser and a lessee together, that's, that could be replaced very easily with technology. Um, I, I think we're seeing that now in the residential side. Uh, we're seeing guys in the commercial side try and mess with that. Um, I, I think our industry is, is no different than, than you know, some of the other industries that are, that are falling victim to technology. If we don't change and offer different values and different uh, uh, different product to our customers, um, you know, we, we are also at, at risk of going away. I totally agree. See, that was amazing words of wisdom because, you know, I think the difference is what I like to say is that it's the, the difference that a trusted advisor makes, right. versus, right. you know, a, a quote unquote broker, which I always look at as like a curse word. I think that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when somebody refers to me as a broker, I think about, you know, somebody who's just trying to put a square peg into a round hole to earn a fee. And, you know, that's not going to really work moving forward. You really need to add value to the people that you're working alongside of. Uh, and Mark, while I have the opportunity, I want to be able to say to you, thank you for so much for making an impact and giving me a shot when I was a kid uh, and, and, you know, putting me on the Chipotle account, it means, means the world to me. Honestly, I truly mean it because uh, I wouldn't be where I am today if that didn't happen. And, uh, and I appreciate it very much. Well, uh, first of all, number one, you earned it. Uh, number two, you've given me quite a bit as well. I, I truly think back to that first meeting uh, when I go into a new meeting and, and uh, say, I said, what, what was it that Jay did that made me hire him? Because uh, I, I want people to have a similar uh, feeling about me when I walk out. So you, you had a great, uh, you made a significant enough impact on me where, where it's something I think back on often. And, and uh, it, it definitely affects what I do preparing uh, before I meet a new client. That means the world, man. I appreciate true, you. Man. True. I appreciate your time. Same Thank here, you. brother. Thanks for joining me, man. I'll speak to you later. Same here. Take care. Be safe. Cause this is digital discussions.